My name is Ismael Chivite. I work in, in Esri as a product manager. And I was invited this year by Peter and Tim to share with you a little bit about our vision in Esri and also some of the new things that we are working on from a technology perspective. Now, before I go into the heart of the presentation, I want to share with you something uh, very special. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I received a call from a good friend of mine. He told me, hey, Ismael, remember that trip we did in Europe, 1994? I found the photos that you took, and I actually scanned them. So this is David. That's my good old friend, Luis, and Javier. Uh, this is my bicycle. I still keep it, actually. And that's my guitar, which I no longer have. We all loved maps at the time. We still do. And we loved maps because with them, we could actually go to places all over the place. The food wasn't really great. Pasta, maybe, at best. But we went to little towns, like this one in Italy. Um, we discovered very magical places in the middle of nowhere. This is in the south of France. Uh, we visited monumental uh, cities, impossible towns, just beautiful, beautiful places. The food actually wasn't that bad. We actually ate ice cream from time to time, as you can see. And we love to go up the mountains with the bicycle, up and up, as far as we could go, as far as high as the mountains would let us. Uh, this is in, in the Alps. This is the price coming down the, you know, the roads as fast as you can, passing the cars if you can. This is totally fake. He didn't fall. You can see he's actually smiling. Yeah. We did kind of crazy things from time to time, but we were not crazy. We just wanted to have a good time. This is uh, Côte d'Azur. We did just things out of the ordinary. This was every night we were trying to look for a place to, to spend the night for free. Schools, churches, abandoned buildings, anywhere to cover from rain. And this was one of the first photos that I found from the Czech Republic. I was kind of intrigued by stores. This was 1994. Now, this was actually a pretty well-stocked store at the time. And coming from Austria, Italy, and other countries, coming into the Czech Republic was kind of like a very separate, different thing. Uh, this has changed quite a bit now. Coming to Prague, it looks like a shopping mall, right? Shopping mall everywhere. There are some things that haven't changed, though. The color of the sky is actually now about the same as more than 20 years ago in August. It was actually kind of rainy that day when we were in Prague. Um, touristy places haven't changed. But if you look at people, people have changed. You used to have people from maybe a few thousand kilometers from here. Now they come from tens of thousands of kilometers to visit your city. You know who I am talking about, right? The, the beauty of the city hasn't changed, really. I have great memories. I think this is Chesky Krumlov. You, maybe you can correct me here. Um, but if my memory serves, beautiful, absolutely beautiful city. Musicians in the bridge, that hasn't changed either. I feel really lucky of having been able to just visit this great world that we live in. And with that, I'm going to talk about our vision in Esri. The theme of this talk is GIS as an intelligent 
nervous uh, system. This is built on the methador, uh, metaphor of the human nervous system, which is essential to life, you may argue is our most important organ. The human nervous system does more than just respond to a stimulus. It's an organ that allows us to sense what is happening around us, and it uses multiple sources of information that may sound familiar to you. Uh, what we see, what we hear, what we touch, what we smell. We bring all of this information and we couple it with uh, logic, with uh, reasoning, ethics, values and emotions, and then we take action. The great thing about this is that even with age, we may lose hearing, we may lose sight, but we actually get better at making decisions. It's a system that learns from mistakes, feeds itself from data and experience, and gets better and better. We learn continuously. Our world resembles a living organism. It has complex, interconnected systems, and they are constantly changing, transforming, evolving. And we as humans are part of it. Now, our human footprint is creating many challenges. Uh, we are kind of behaving like children, building uh, or having a life that uh, creates social conflict, um, pollutes, uh, we are creating issues with biodiversity, etc. We are not creating, doesn't look like we are, a sustainable future. So our world really needs sort of a nervous system. We, as humans, need to be collectively more intelligent and responsive. We need to help humans understand what is happening around us so we can use that information with our values, ethics, emotions to collaborate and take action, positive action. And geography is essential, actually, to this vision. Geography is the science of our world, and it provides content, and even most importantly, context. Geography combines sociology with climate, with geology, with biology. All the ologies come together with geography. These sciences come together with geography so we can build relationships and patterns and associations. And it creates a common reference system, maps, that can help us make people understand. So we can, again, intelligent, intelligently respond to what is happening in our world. Digital geography and uh, GIS provide us with a framework and a process to build this geospatial nervous system. It allows us to measure many things around us, uh, economic, social indicators, natural indicators, physical indicators, and then use these digital maps and GIS to visualize this information, to basically map it. So we can run analysis and predictions. So we can sit around a table with other people of many different disciplines and use that common view of the world so we can make decisions and take action. We can respond to challenges. This is really the foundation of a geospatial infrastructure as a concept. You are already building, in a way, your own geospatial infrastructures in your own companies, departments, in your own cities and countries. This allows us to use the science of WHERE and GIS at scale, so we can share and collaborate with people. 
the common characteristics of these geospatial platforms are integrating all types of data. This is about sensing what is happening out there. Everything from imagery to tabular data, unstructured uh, text and documents, vector data, 3D, real-time sensors, big data, LiDAR, and beam models. All of that, all of these senses, like your sight and your smell, all of them, they come together into maps, scenes, and layers. Geospatial infrastructures, at the heart of them, there is advanced spatial analysis and data science. And this aspect is actually evolving, like everything else. It's more than just spatial analysis, map algebra, and geostatistics. They are great, they continue to be relevant. But now we need to integrate other new things like big data analytics and notebooks and distributed systems, artificial intelligence and machine learning, open science as well. Effective geospatial platforms engage and interconnect with communities around them, bringing people together and stakeholders. This is already happening at many different levels. And here you have some great examples of organizations that are building these geospatial platforms for many different reasons. Uh, the Port of Rotterdam, for example, has transformed port operations through IoT, Internet of Things, where they monitor everything that breathes and moves within the port. And the view of what is happening in the port is a map. The map bring is, brings everything together so decisions can be made to operate the port. Cities like uh, Three Rivers or Douglas County or the city of San Francisco, they are using geospatial infrastructures to engage with the community to describe how the city is going to evolve over time to help them participate in the urban planning process or to simply report issues in the city that uh, eventually will be addressed. We are all on this together, building this notion of a nervous system, a geographical, geospatial infrastructure, so we can actually start understanding our world better and communicating with people. Your work is really essential and is not just technology. This is going to take leadership, envisioning what is possible and learning, always learning from our own mistakes and from people around them through collaboration and through sharing of ideas. It takes a strategic thinking Engaging, engaging people within our own organization, but also outside our organizations. And of course, it takes passion, passion for our own world and to, creative, to create understanding of what is going on. We can all do this uh, leveraging the science of where to see what others cannot. Next, I'm going to talk about technology. The technology that we build in ESRI uh, to actually help you achieve this vision. RGIS is advancing rapidly. I would say maybe so fast that it's hard to keep pace with it. Uh, but this is just because everything is changing actually very quickly these days. Many things around us. And our mission in ESRI is to keep an eye on everything that is going on from a technology perspective so we can bring as many things as possible into GIS to make our work more effective. ESRI invests 30% of, I guess, your money in R&D. Uh, this is a huge amount of our revenue that goes into R&D. So we have teams in different uh, R&D centers around the globe that are uh, specializing on different types of 
trends, uh, 3D, Internet of Things, uh, big data, etc. And these teams work together in their own R&D centers so we can actually bring, productize these features into the software. So just like geography is a science that brings together all the other sciences, GIS is also a technology that is tightly interconnected with many things that at first don't look like very geographic. ArcGIS is the main technology that we build in Esri um, and that you actually um, use. ArcGIS is a comprehensive geospatial platform. It's services based to support distributed systems. It's extendable and open so it can communicate with other systems within your organization. ArcGIS can be deployed in your own infrastructure securely on your own servers, but also can be leveraged or used in a cloud environment as a software, as a service platform. ArcGIS Online is the product, actually, that materializes ArcGIS in what we call is the Esri Geospatial Cloud. ArcGIS Online is a complete mapping and location software as a service offering. It's actually the world's largest mapping and data sharing ecosystem. It has over 7 million users and billions of maps are created in it. Last count, we had over 25 million items, maps and scenes and geoprocessing models stored, managed within ArcGIS Online is really exploding from a um, use perspective. I will be describing today not all, just a few of the interesting developments and trends that are happening in ArcGIS Online. First, I want to highlight this idea as a reminder that ArcGIS is not just software, it's also content. ArcGIS includes the living atlas of the world. It has over 7,000 layers of authoritative content that you can use with ArcGIS. These maps are used every day to derive more and more information products. Today, I want to bring this up to you because it's really a collective effort to populate the living atlas of the world with useful content. This is underlying the idea of actually sharing. Sharing our own data in an environment where others around us can actually take advantage of it. There are multiple organizations here that are contributing to the living atlas of the world. And I want to say thanks to many of them. And I want to encourage you to also learn about the Living Atlas so you can see how you can actually contribute your content, make it easily accessible for people to use it. The story maps is one of these things within ArcGIS. It's, it's really a whole new way to tell stories. And this is important because as geographers, of course, we use maps to communicate ideas. Everybody gets maps. But you can take your maps to the next level through storytelling techniques. And this comes a little bit, you know, um, is not at the heart of what GIS people do. But we actually get much better when we learn from others how to tell stories with our maps we make geography much more powerful from a communication perspective. The use of story maps is growing exponentially. We have over a million stories that have been created so far. And on an average day, our users create roughly around 3,000 different story maps a day. So you can imagine how many millions and millions of views this, this is. This is only telling of the power of building story maps to communicate things that are important to us. From a technical perspective, we have been working over the past 
uh, two years, re-engineering the idea of the story maps, bringing it to another level in terms of you know, modernizing the user experience. I'm lucky enough to have Andrek today with me, who's going to give you like a seven or eight minute presentation on the new story maps. Come, come over, Andrek. Dobré odpoledne. Uh, story mapy, které také znáte pod názvem Mapy s příběhem, přicházejí v nové generaci. Jsou jednodušší a dostupné úplně všem. My si takovouto story mapu ukážeme a ukážeme si její funkcionalitu na příběhu sklidnění dopravy, kdy si ukážeme novou funkcionalitu. Já jsem si uh, pro tento účel připravil koncept. Tento koncept obsahuje úvodní stránku a několik málo textů, které obohatíme o další nové prvky. Uh, úvodní obrazovku nebo úvodní stránku můžete doplnit o dynamické video, které uh, zvýší atraktivitu vašich story map. Dalším prvkem, který budeme chtít přidat, bude uh, lepší popis nebo větší obsah popisu pro dopravní význam stavby. Máme zde umístěný nějaký text, uh, který obsahuje uh, zkrácený popis a my si přes uh, toto tlačítko plus budeme chtít přidat tlačítko a toto tlačítko si pojmenujeme jako technická průvodka, A do odkazu vložíme odkaz na web. Kde je podrobně popsán tento projekt. Další prvek, který budeme chtít vložit, bude prvek, prvek v podobě situační mapy. Vložíme si ho jako obrázek. Máme předpřipravenou situační mapu. Tento prvek můžeme, nebo tento obrázek můžeme dále upravovat, můžeme ho například zvětšit na rozsah požadované stránky. Dalším prvkem, který budeme chtít přidat, je nový prvek, který se jmenuje boční blok. Tento prvek obsahuje dvě části, pravou a levou část, kdy obě dvě části jsou na sobě závislé. Do pravé části budeme chtít přidat mapu, a vybereme si mapu, kterou jsme si připravili v Argis Online. Tato mapa nám znázorňuje návrh nového úseku a šest bodů, které značí meziúrovňové křížení. Upravíme si legendu. Tuto legendu musíme zpřístupnit. Zpřístupníme ji přes tlačítko nastavení. A přidáme legendu. Přidá se nám do levého spodního rohu. Upravíme si rozsah mapy, který budeme chtít publikovat a klepneme na tlačítko umístit mapu. Mapa se nám umístí, vykreslí a my k ní budeme chtít přidat ještě další, uh, další popisek. Takže vložíme text, který můžeme ještě dále uh, formátovat. Takže Uděláme, přidáme mu podnadpisek a necháme text. Další, tento boční blok je specifický v tom, že jak, jak se pohybujeme, tak se střídá tento obsah, proto my tady přes tlačítko plus přidáme další stránku tohoto bočního bloku. Opět přidáme mapu, vybereme tu stejnou mapu, kterou jsme přidávali, ale změníme její rozsah. Zaměříme se na jedno vybrané meziúrovňové křížení a umístíme mapu. K tomu přidáme odpovídající text, respektive popisek, a přidáme uh, situační obrázek. Stejným způsobem bychom mohli pokračovat dále. Chová se to potom tak, že jak se pohybujeme s rolem uh, mezi jednotlivými uh, obrazovkami, tak se nám mění obsah v obou těchto oknech. Další prvek, který můžeme přidat, tak jsou to embedované objekty. Takovýmto embedovaným objektem může být například formulář. Vložíme ho přes nabídku vložit. A já jsem si v aplikaci Survey1234 Argus připravil formulář, který si skopíruji a vložím si ho do, svého, do své story mapy. Tento formulář se mi načte a já pomocí něho budu moct sbírat podněty k této plánované úpravě. 
Dalším prvkem, který budu chtít uh, přidat, je možnost uh, pro případ sbírání těchto podnětů uh, osobně a budu to chtít doplnit o mapku, která mi bude znázorňovat, uh, kde je možné tyto podněty sbírat a kde se budou zpracovávat. Přes tlačítko plus přidám mapu a tentokrát využijí nové možnosti a to je vytvořit expresní mapu. Tato možnost je specifická v tom, že nepotřebujete mít tuto mapu nikde uloženou a vy ji vlastně velmi rychle dynamicky vytvoříte pro ten daný konkrétní účel. My si vyhledáme město Úvaly. A tento bod přidáme do mapy. Přidáme ještě dva body, které můžeme tímto způsobem očíslovat. Doplníme o grafiku, která bude znázorňovat průběh zpracování nebo respektive místo, kde budou podněty sezbírány a kde budou následně zpracovány. Upravíme si rozsah a vybereme možnost umístit mapu. Takhle rychle jsme byli schopni naši story mapu obohatit o mapu, kterou jsme doteď neměli nikde připravenou. Další možnosti, které můžeme upravovat, je na záložce návrh, kdy můžeme říct, že celý vzhled této story mapy chceme přeměnit do černého stylu. Dynamicky se nám upraví i jednotlivé mapová okna a jejich grafika. Můžeme si vybrat text, který se nám bude zobrazo text a formátování, kterým se nám bude zobrazovat. Můžeme přidat logo které se nám přidá doleva nahoru, můžeme pod něj například umístit i odkaz. Na závěr se podíváme na náhled a podíváme se, jak naše story mapa teda bude ve finále vypadat. Načte se nám a my v ní můžeme listovat. S rolem listuji dolů a dojedu na dynamický blok, boční blok, který se nám mění právě podle obsahu, který aktuálně se zobrazuje. Pokud vás nové story mapy zaujaly a rádi byste se o nich dozvěděli více, tak určitě navštivte miniseminář kolegy, kolegyně Markety Pecenové v předsálí a ta vám ukáže ještě další možnosti. Děkuji. What do you think? Is that great? I know many of you are RGS Pro users, so I thought I would share a few ideas with you. Now, in, in, a few, in a few minutes or so, uh, the team is going to give you more demos of ArcGIS Pro, but I wanted to have a few words about ArcMap and ArcGIS Pro. In the desktop software in ArcGIS, ArcMap is pretty much done. It's mature software, and you know it well. That's what it's going to keep doing. We barely have any development right now on ArcMap, so it's cruising. Everything new, every fix will come into ArcGIS Pro. So if not already, you should be planning about um, progressively moving to ArcGIS Pro all of your work. This is not going to happen overnight, but it's not a matter of if, it's really when. Uh, the team is obviously working ferociously now on version 2.5. I want to um, share with you this example. This is actually from the, your mapping agency. It's a screenshot uh, that was shared with me yesterday um, about their one to 5,000 scale maps, which are on the works, planned to be finished by 2022, if I, correct, uh, if I believe um, correctly, if I remember correctly. So this is kind of proof of ArcGIS Pro being already a tool that you can use for many of your workflows. I want to share also a little bit about the future, what is coming in 2.5, 2.6, 2.7. And specifically, I want to talk about this work on voxel layers. It's not the only thing coming, it's just one peak from the battery of features that are coming in. This is actually a recording from an internal meeting in Esri, a development uh, team meeting, discussing the rendering of multidimensional data within ArcGIS Pro. So you are going to look first at this map. This is a map um, created by, uh, in the Netherlands, it's a geology map, and you can see that it's overlaid 
draped on top of a 3D model, but doesn't quite look 3D, it's 2.5D. However, you can turn it on, it's actually multi-dimensional data, and instead of having flat pixels, you can actually have pixels that are like cubes, voxel layers. This allows a geologist, for example, to cut across section and look at the data very differently. This is showing the use of continuous data with this voxel data. Think about pollution in the atmosphere, in soils, in the oceans, and you can again get your own cross sections and also play with transparencies to understand the distribution of continuous data in, in volumes. Uh, this is again, you know, one of many different features that are coming up in ArcGIS, ArcGIS Pro. I also want to highlight uh, this capability within the ArcGIS platform to location enable all aspects of your field work. And this is a topic of particular interest because we never had before the luxury of having devices like a phone or a tablet that could run GIS software with a lot of storage, with a built-in GPS, a camera, a compass, a microphone, and so many other sensors. This makes mobile devices actually the ideal hardware to run GIS. And we have created a collection of out-of-the-box configurable applications for the field worker. As some of you, you might be familiar already, like collector for ArcGIS for data capture, uh, Survey123 is today the fastest growing mobile application in the Esri suite of applications. But we also have new applications like Tracker. Tracker is an application that allows you to track the movement of assets and people within your organization. So you can later on look at the historical data to do analysis or to represent this data in real time so you can make decisions. There are other mobile applications like ArcGIS Quick Capture. Uh, this one was released in July this year and is available on iOS, Android, and Windows. I'm going to play for you a short two minute video so you can see the concept of ArcGIS Quick Capture. Introducing ArcGIS Quick Capture, the rapid data collection app. ArcGIS Quick Capture is the simplest way to capture field observations. Record features while on the road. Digitize tracks as you ride. Or simply capture data on the go. Record GIS data with a single tap on your device. And send it back to the office in real time without stopping. The app's intuitive big button interface requires no training at all. Record a location, photo and observation type with a single tap. Store data as points, lines or polygons. Record multiple features simultaneously. Work online and offline on iOS, Android and Windows. Customize your quick capture projects to optimize field work. Increase productivity while scouting or capturing data at speed. When you're done in the field, quick capture data is ready to use in ArcGIS. Gain insights from the field that you can use right away for better decision making. Use Quick Capture whenever you need to collect high quality spatial data fast. Use it for aerial surveys, in emergency response, or for agriculture, transportation, and public safety. Whatever you want to capture, it all starts with the touch of a button. So the, the idea creating these different user experiences for field data capture, the map-centric approach of collector, the form-centric approach of survey, 
or this big button approach with quick capture is to give you the flexibility to help field users use the the user experience that really fits their own workflows. So there is not a single mobile application that you will be able to apply to all workflows. You will need to carefully select the experience that fits best the way people work in the field. Next, I'm going to talk about spatial analysis and data science, which is really like the heart of GIS. Uh, many of you, I imagine, got initially attracted into the world of GIS because of its analysis, analytical capabilities. And there are many different improvements that are on the works in the ArcGIS platform. I'm going to touch on just a couple of items that I think are important. Uh, the first one is this notion of hosted Python notebooks. They are interesting because they change a little bit the way you can run and document your own geospatial analysis. They help you integrate a network of distributed services. So you can actually work as usual with data that runs in your own computer that is hosted locally from a database, from files, but also from external web services. So you can do analysis in a distributed fashion. Not only you can access data from multiple services easily with Python notebooks, but you can also bring in into your analysis other environments like uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow, Keras and Conda, uh, these tools to complement really the analysis that you are doing. Python notebooks are stored in ArcGIS as items. So you can actually use groups to share them with other people and you can use them to run your analysis, but they in themselves are actually a documentation of your tradecraft, your process to actually answer questions. The, the other aspect I want to highlight is this idea of using artificial intelligence and machine learning within ArcGIS. And this you know, may sound like futuristic, uh, but it, it really isn't. The foundations of um, machine learning and artificial, uh, artificial intelligence were laid down a long time ago, actually in the 1800s. Now, the evolution of artificial intelligence, our ability to make machines actually learn so they can predict things, has evolved dramatically over the past 25 years, to the point that any of us in this room can actually get started with artificial intelligence and machine learning to do very practical things that will help us in our everyday work. Artificial intelligence is not this science fiction type of thing. We are surrounded by it, whether we like it or not, today. I'm going to show you just a handful of examples where, you know, these machine learning techniques and artificial intelligence can be, can be leveraged. In this case, you are simply looking at a base map. I was looking outside in the exhibit at the orthophoto map that you have for the country. Amazing imagery. You can actually use machine learning techniques to extract information out of this data. So again, this is just an, an orthophoto map. That's all it is, is just JPEG files. Training ArcGIS, you can teach the machine to recognize certain objects within these traditional data sets. In this case, it's looking for swimming pools. You will see later another demonstration um, illustrating this, this technique. In the demonstration that you will see later, you will look at AI and machine learning techniques used in a traditional way where you bring your data into a big machine and then the big machine runs the inference on that data to extract the features that you want. In this case, the trick is that all the analysis to find these pools that you can see now highlighted in blue, all of this has been executed from my web browser. The next example I want to show you is really not about working with a static image, but actually with a video feed. 
So in this case, we flew a drone and we got the drone fixed in the air, just shooting video down. It's a phantom um, drone. And here you can see that through machine learning techniques, we can identify cars. Not only we can tell that this is a car, we can tell that this is a car moving. And through the different frames in the video, we can actually track to understand the movement, the motion of the car within the parking lot. We can also use this information to cross-reference it with our geographical data. So we can tell if a car is within a particular polygon on lot or it is actually parked. We can also, you can see here, looking at speeding, we can actually detect speeding. So this is in interesting because it allows us to um, really understand behaviors. In this case, we are just looking at a parking lot. Where are the open parking spaces? We can use that information to help people find them, but we can also study patterns over time, which parking spaces don't get used as often, how much driving people need to do to get into a particular place. This technique can actually apply to an entire city, so you understand how people actually uh, move and behave over time just by looking at video cameras. In the last example that I want to show you, um, I'm actually I'm going to use my mobile phone. So I would like the lights to be turned on and now you can see my phone here. There you go. So I have a little application here that is going to run analysis on the video. So at a rate of 30 frames per second, we're actually looking at the images and you can see that we can detect people, TV, the screen, the glass, the bottle, you can see that. So this is happening in my phone. This is not like a big server in the cloud doing the analysis. This is just my smartphone doing analysis on the fly in a consumer device. So why is this important? Because all these field data collection tools that we have will soon be able to leverage this. This is just a prototype that we are working on. But the idea is to actually bring this into the quick capture application that you saw. So you can pretty much put it on autopilot. So we can capture geographic objects as you are driving or moving in a car, for example. So this shows a little bit kind of the, the potential of using these machine learning techniques uh, for GIS. But it's only just an example. The ability of computers to predict things is pretty amazing if we train them correctly. In terms of ArcGIS Enterprise, um, we are working to build the architecture of ArcGIS Enterprise again to modernize it, to keep it up to the times. Many years ago, I actually worked in the ArcGIS server team at the time, and we worked on this architecture move from the old ArcObjects architecture and the Web ADF to the architecture that you are leveraging today and the REST API and JavaScript API. And those were amazing times. Uh, it was about transforming server technology so we could do more with less. Uh, so, so server or enterprise now is going through a similar process where the team is working on making sure that you can use containers to deploy your servers in your own infrastructure, but also in cloud infrastructures. The team is working on micro services, so you can deploy more easily the specific aspects of ArcGIS Enterprise that actually do the job that um, you need. And of course, along with this, now ArcGIS Enterprise supports Python notebooks. It supports machine learning and AI, so you can use your own server to train and to run the models that you create, the AI models that you create. The other aspect of server that I think is very important to highlight is this aspect of real-time analytics. This allows us to integrate sensor networks and IoT into your own ArcGIS enterprise. 
I think about traffic, uh, pollution, uh, data from uh, pipes and power lines, all in real time coming in into your own server so you can detect anomalies within the system or you can even predict behaviors that are about to happen, failures, all through a real-time system built on ArcGIS and with geographic capabilities. This idea of real-time analytics today exists within ArcGIS Enterprise. You will soon see in ArcGIS Online similar capabilities. So rather than having your own infrastructure running, you can leverage our infrastructure in Esri so you can feed your IoT devices to the Esri cloud and have Esri run the analysis for you as you configure it. This is a key aspect of this geospatial infrastructure concept, kind of this um, nervous system that I described in the vision bit. You know, this is a key aspect of feeding ArcGIS with data that we can use for decision making. I also want to talk just briefly about licensing. Um, I want to highlight this idea of the ArcGIS user types. So as you know, to license ArcGIS software, uh, you often need to use these user levels. We have level one for viewing, we have level twos for creating. Those levels have been transformed, expanded into a more granular system, the one you are looking at in this slide, where you have different licenses that progressively disclose capabilities within the platform. And the reason to do this is to actually give you more flexibility to pay for what you actually need. So you have the viewer types, uh, which are actually free with ArcGIS Enterprise, that allow people to just view at information products that other people create. The editor, editors can view, but they can also change features, but they cannot create new content. They can only update existing features. The field worker is really an editor with the mobile applications, survey one, two, three, collector and quick capture for field work. And then you jump into the creator user type that allows you to create new content. Mash up layers, create a map. Get those maps, create a story map. Publish a new feature service to persist more data. Create a project for the field workers. And then we have the GIS professional, which unlocks ArcGIS desktop. ArcGIS Pro, basic, standard, and advanced. We are adding also some very specific uh, user types like the insights analyst. This unlocks a very powerful client or application within the ArcGIS platform that lets you create visualizations to really explore interactively the data from a geographic perspective. You can combine actually these maps with many other charts and spatial, temp spatial temporal analytics and link analysis, etc. Insights is a product that is in constant evolution. It shipped initially as part of ArcGIS Enterprise. It's now part of ArcGIS Online, but it also now is including connectors to link analysis, to public sharing, and to Python and even R integration. I also want to highlight the work on app builders because these Technology is very useful for a person without developer skills to create fully functional web applications. So here you might be familiar with Web App Builder, where you can literally drag and drop components and create your own web applications for editing, for analysis, for visualization. Web App Builder is getting better, but not as Web App Builder, as Experience Builder. Experience Builder is in beta now, and is you can think of it as the next generation of Web App Builder. It has everything you know about Web App Builder, but much more to create even more powerful and better looking web applications. Of course, with both Web App Builder and Experience Builder, we leverage an extensibility framework. So in case that you want to do things that are not coming out of the box, you can actually extend them with the JavaScript API.
as well. Uh, last, I'm going to just enumerate uh, this idea of geo-enabled systems. These are products that we are creating in Esri on top of ArcGIS to tackle the needs of very specific uh, workflows. So I will just go very quickly here and describe some of them. The first one is Urban. It's really a system for planning and managing urban development. You cannot think of this as a GIS geek. You need to think of this as a, an urban planner. This is where urban planning and GIS really get together. This is a complete system where you can really bring your cities in 3D, bring in data from BIM models, from Revit, and, and visualize them. But visualize them not just as pretty objects, but actually GIS 3D features that can be linked to the actual urban plans. This is also a tool for collaboration where you can publish different projects for the city to the public or to small groups to enable collaboration. And again, the point here is that this is specifically designed for urban planners. So it eliminates much of the GIS jargon and complexity that many of us are used to handle. The second one is indoors. We have been, of course, working with GIS outside for the past 40 years, but we live within, we spend a lot of time within buildings. So indoors is really about allowing you to do enterprise mapping for your own organizations. It helps you with uh, the management of assets within uh, buildings. And just like Urban is specifically designed for indoor operations. The hub is also a critical component, particularly for uh, government agencies, national regions, also small, small governments. The hub is what you use to engage with the community, to share data, open APIs, to share plans and initiatives, to engage with the community, them contributing data and ideas into your own uh, GIS system. This is what we actually use to describe the problems in our city, in our country, what we are doing about them, how people can help contribute to those challenges. Again, specifically designed for engagement. As professionals, your work, you can think of your work within your own organizations, but I like to think of it as something that is part of a much larger initiative. We are here to influence how we think and action on top of this uh, planet. This is really back to the initial idea of just being positive and think about how our work can really make a difference in our cities, in our countries, and ultimately the world. So with this, I finish my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.